it's 1031, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, welcome, one and all. We're so glad you're here this morning at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Erie's online sanctuary. My name is Reverend Christina Church, and I am so pleased, proud, and privileged to serve this wonderful community of folks as its minister. It is the congregation's custom to ring a bell to begin our services, and in this online version of our service, we invite you to be a part of that. So in a moment, I'll ask you to mute, and if you have a bell or some kind of noisemaker, we're going to make a joyful noise to open this service this morning. So go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like to participate, and let us Call the faithful to Sunday services. Thank you for that lovely beginning. Our opening words this morning are from the poet Starhawk, who says in her poem, community means strength. We are all longing to go home to some place we've never been a place half remembered and half envisioned that we can only catch glimpses of from time to time, community. Somewhere there are people to whom we can speak with passion without having the words catch in our throats. Sorry, I just lost my place without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere a circle of friends will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength. And it's strength that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done. Arms to hold us when we falter a circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. Now to continue the welcoming into that circle, we also like to sing Hal Walker's welcoming song. And we have Annette this morning to welcome one and all to this community. Whoever you are, we welcome you. Wherever you come from, we welcome you. Whoever you love, we welcome you. Whoever you are, we welcome you. Wherever you come from, we welcome you. Whoever you love, we welcome you. Whoever you love, we welcome you. Whoever you love, we welcome you. Beautiful. Thank you, Annette. And now Jackson will continue the welcome with a prelude, Sonata in F by Ludwig von Beethoven.
Beautiful as always. Thank you, Jackson. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our faith and I invite you to light one if you have one at home or to light a candle along with me as I light my chalice and say these words if you would like by Judith Quarles. At this hour, in small towns and in big cities, in Zoom rooms and virtual sanctuaries, many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. As we light our chalice today, let us remember that we are part of a great community of faith. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideas of love, of justice, and of truth. And now the chalice is lit. This congregation also has a couple of statements of covenant, statements of our relationship amongst ourselves and the wider community. The first one is known as the universal covenant. And we actually have some hand motions that go along with it. Is there anyone out there who would be interested in leading that this morning? I can do that, Nancy. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Go for it. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. We care for the earth and each other. Thank you so much. This congregation also has what is called a bond of union. It's a statement of how we want to be together and how we want to be in the world that was adopted in 1898. And I will leave this, the words will be on your screen. I invite you to say them along with me while muted. We, we unite ourselves together for the study and practice of morality and religion as interpreted by the growing thought and noblest lives of humanity, believing that we may thereby prove helpful one to another and promote the cause of truth, righteousness, and love in the world. Thank you. Now is the time for all ages, and I am going to be sharing about the power and the importance of community today. So I'm actually going to take my, uh, my virtual background off so that my, my ghostly son here can, can join us a little more fully. So if you'll just hang on for a second while I do that. Oh, okay. Of course, he's better at it than I am, so he's going to do it real quickly. Uh, two for two background. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay. So now, instead of that lovely virtual background, you have the picture that it actually comes from, which is a little smaller. Um, you see how that illusion gets made. And so my son, Raphael, is here to help us because we're going to be telling a story and if anyone would like to participate uh, in the activity that goes along with the story, you're welcome to, as long as your parents say it's okay, because we're gonna be using some pasta to demonstrate the story. Um, the pasta is going to stand in for a bundle of sticks that the story talks about. This is a story from one of my favorite writers, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. Uh, she is a storyteller and also a therapist, and she wrote a really great book that I love called Women Who Run 
with the wolves that has all kinds of really helpful stories. This one is a story that she collected and it, uh, it is a, actually an African story and it's about uh, a leader who was dying and he called all of his people together and he, he called them to his bedside and he said to all of his um, community members, to his children, to all the people that he was going to be leaving behind, he, he gave each one of them a short but sturdy stick and he said to them, break the stick. And so they all, Raf is going to demonstrate with a piece of spaghetti. <laughs> So they tried and they tried and each one of them was able to break the stick. And then he said, he gave them each a group of sticks to represent a, a family. And he said, a family is much stronger than an individual because they are together. And he said, now try and, try and break the stick. All right, well, there goes pasta all over my kitchen. I know what I'm going to be doing later on today. <laughs> maybe the dog will maybe the dog will take care of some of that. All right, so so it's a little harder to break a family, but it can still be broken uh, with a lot of strength. Now he said, take a whole bundle of sticks in your hand, and so. The people took a bundle of sticks. Here's a bundle of sticks. And, and each one of them tried with their hands to break the bundle of sticks. It's a lot harder, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Rafa has the hand strength mm -hmm. at age 10 to break a big bundle of sticks like this. And you'll notice that we have several different kinds of pasta here. We have we have uh, soybean pasta and edamame pasta. And so there's all different sizes and shapes and colors. So that makes it even stronger and more diverse because there are more voices and there's more beauty and more perspectives and more points of view. So, so this leader who was dying said, no one can break the sticks when there's a large bundle. And he concludes by saying, we are strong when we stand with many other souls. When we are together with one another, we cannot be broken. And that is the end of the time for all ages. Thank you, Rafa. I think we'll be having some pasta real soon. Yeah. <laughs> Or at least the dog will. Or at least the dog will, yes. yes. <laughs> it's now time for our chance to be generous and practice a different kind of love for this community, one where we open our hearts and share our resources with one another. We know that this community exists because of the generosity of all of us who care about it. And so I invite you to make a contribution. You can send a check to the address that will be on your screen. You can also give online by going to uuerie.org slash donate. And while you are doing that or making plans to do that, we'll be listening to Jackson's wonderful playing in a piece called Chameleon by Herbie Hancock.
Thank you so much, Jackson. And thanks to all who contribute their resources, their time, their talent to this wonderful community. Well, a few days ago, we, my family, received word that my son Rafa's school will be reopening in-person classes for grades three and four. The pre-kindergarten through second grades have already been back for almost a month now. And Rafael, who you just met or just saw, who's 10 now, he's in fourth grade. He's been doing virtual school like many of our children and grandchildren. He's been doing it for nearly a year now and it's not been easy for him. He's a people person who, who loves going to school and seeing his teachers and friends every day. And so this time of being at home has been, been a stretch. When we got the news that his school is opening, he started jumping up and down, so excited to be going back. And part of me was jumping and excited too. And yet as happy as I am for him, and as much as I want him to be able to return to school, I also have so many questions, so many misgivings. Research says that schools are not a major source of spread of the virus, but, but how safe is it really uh, for everyone? Do I pr prioritize my son's mental health over, over his and others' physical well being? and safety? Have all of his teachers been able to receive the vaccine by now? And are their personal health decisions really even any of my business? How will teachers teach the kids in the classroom and also teach the kids whose families have needed to keep them at home? And is it fair to ask teachers to do this? One of the kids who will be staying at home is, um, is my son's best friend who has type one diabetes and must not be exposed to the virus. In my heart, I'm also worried that, that Rafa will be deeply disappointed when he gets back to school and he finds that his masked distanced technology heavy classroom does not match the memories that he has developed of his beloved school days from his past. That place, as we heard in this morning's reading, that place where eyes light up when they see him coming. That place where there are hands to catch him when he falls. Now, Maybe some of the reasons that this is occupying my mind so much is that I know the time is coming when all of these questions will have to be asked and discussed and answered about my workplace, which is our congregation. And I know that so many of us, so many of us are longing to return home to that beloved community that we remember. But my fear is also that we haven't considered how we ourselves and our communities have been forever changed by the experiences that we've had during this pandemic and how we may not be able to go home, at least not that place that we're remembering, not, not a return to the same place we loved. Except if we make peace with the idea that we'll be going home to some place that we really have never been. So now I would like for us to sing a little bit. I like to 
break up these these experiences sometimes with some some music to give us a break from talking heads on a screen. So uh, the words will be on your screen to hymn number 354. We laugh, we cry. We're going to sing verse one and all of us will be muted uh, while Jackson sings and plays for us to follow. Sorry. Uh... We laugh, we cry, we live, we die, we dance and sing our song. We need to fear something here which we can be long. <laughs> We need to feel the freedom just to have some time alone. But most of all, we need close friends who call our very own. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. We have found a need to be together. We have our hearts to give. We have our thoughts to receive. And we believe that sharing is an answer. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately too about the experiences of my, uh, my paternal grandmother. Now she was someone who left formal education very early on and never went to high school, but she was so smart about doing things and making things. Hers were the hands that were always there to create and to bless and to beautify. She made incredible, complicated, beautiful quilts, and she tended vegetable and flower gardens. She raised three children on a Kansas farm. She loved square dancing. She loved local sports teams. And she loved going to the little church, the only little church in their little hometown. She loved belonging to every club and community that existed in her small town. The Grange, the Eastern Star, the quilting groups, you name it, she was there. I have a ton of her old name badges from all of these places to prove it. And though she never had any lessons, she could play the piano beautifully. She was a natural musician. She was also a social butterfly and a pillar of that little community. But later in life, when terrible arthritis took away the wonderful abilities of my grandmother's hands, she was devastated. She'd been taught that her value came from her ability to, to do things, to go places, to make things, to use her body in some productive way, to serve the communities that she loved. And when those abilities faded, her vitality faded as well. Friends called and came by less often once she was using a wheelchair and she couldn't just hop in the car and get together with them at a coffee shop. The groups and clubs that she was a part of did not know how to keep their connection with her alive once she was no longer actively serving them. 
I know that it was a bitter reality to her toward the end of her life, that after all her service, there was very little effort made to reach out back to her when she needed it most. There was not as much appreciation for her legacy as she might have hoped. There was not as much effort to include her in whatever way was still possible. Now this story may be similar or it may not to some of the folks in this congregation who may be here this morning or who may not be. Folks who are longing to return home to this place, but eventually found that the community they were longing for was someplace that they have never been. Now, I know that after nearly a year away from our physical space, and from gathering together as a community, many of us are longing to return home. And as your minister, <laughs> I am literally longing to return home to some place, a building where I have never even set foot. But we need to also recognize that, that going back to the way things were is no longer a possibility because this community and all communities are like rivers, rivers that keep on changing around us so that we can never step into the same river or the same community twice. I'm so glad that we now have technology that that has the ability to open up this circle, to receive more of our beloveds, to welcome and bless and have among us those who are far away geographically, those who are not able to travel to the building every Sunday, those who are not comfortable in large gatherings, and those who must protect themselves from infectious diseases, like COVID-19. And I don't want to lose the ability to gather in all of our beloveds every week. I don't want to rush to a precipitous return that doesn't think through how we need to embrace our Unitarian Universalist values in deciding how and when and just what way we return back to our building. And I'm thinking particularly here about our first principle, right? The worth and dignity of every person. And I think that our first principle needs to be absolutely centered in the way that we think about going home to this place that we have never been the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Erie in 2021. I think that if we center that first principle and we think about a return that includes everyone, then we will not go far wrong. And it is my hope that as we have this conversation, we continue to keep these values in mind and that we not lose the gains that we have made with welcoming everyone who would like to be here. And I'm going to stop there and ask Jackson to play and sing for us again and ask us to mute. We will sing uh, verse four of hymn number 354, We Laugh, We Cry. Thank you. I can't see my, okay, okay. I can't see my words because it switched to the, give me one second. Whoops, yeah, we need to go back to verse four. Please. Oops, did we lose the slide?
Okay, I'm just gonna go. <laughs> I don't I don't have the slide. I'm sorry. Oh okay. You want me to still go? Um yeah. you do have the slide. It just says verse one and it's really verse four. Oh, okay. I'll go back. Oh, sorry about that. I think that was me. I apologize. I forgot to change it. Change. Four. <laughs> but the words really are the words to verse four. Thank you, Janet. Good eye. <laughs> We seek elusive answers to the question all of this life. We seek to put an end to all the waste of human strife. We search for truth, equality, and blessed peace of mind. And then we come together here to make sense of what we find. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we have found a joy in being together. And in our search for peace maybe we'll finally see every question truly is an answer every question is an answer You know, my paternal grandfather was a farmer, and I think that spending all of that time alone with the wheat and the soybeans and the corn and the cattle, I guess he had a, a chance to take in some interesting truths and, and go on some interesting flights of imagination during those times out there riding the tractor on the back 40 he said to me once, you know, they're going to have telephones where you can see the other person, you know, and talk to them like they're right there. A lot of people in office buildings are going to meet with people over the phone instead of having to go to meetings. They'll save a lot of money on gas that way, he said. He was always a thrifty guy. Now, in his own way, my grandfather was, was picturing going home to some place that he had never been. And he was, he was longing for that reality. He was, in his own way, he was quite a futurist. And I think he also longed for some place where my grandmother would be able to participate comfortably in all the groups that had always brought her joy. I think he also longed for some place where he could see and, and talk to his son, my father, stationed far away in Alaska, and his grandkids growing up faster than he could possibly keep track of, and who were nearly strangers in a lot of ways. He, he longed for that place, he longed for that community, but he did not get to see it in his lifetime. Well, as we know, the future that my grandpa envisioned is here and we are living it. It's opened up so many possibilities, hasn't it? Zoom has given us a way to be together while staying safe and I'm deeply, deeply grateful for it. But it's also unsatisfying for for bodies that are longing to get together and share space and break bread together and eat birthday cake and sing songs and hug each other. And so as we come upon this anniversary of the time of social distancing, the anniversary of 
our society closing down during the pandemic. And as we start to contemplate a world beyond this time, I want to invite you all to think about a return to our building in terms of those Unitarian Universalist values around community, around inclusion. Now, such an approach makes things much more complicated. Why can't we just go back to the way things were? Well, I hope that we realize, all of us, that we can't do that because we have all been changed by these experiences. And the horizons of what's possible have changed too. Folks who haven't been able to join us in the past are here now. Some for the first time and some back again after an absence. And we are blessed with your presence. We're so glad to have you here among us. More community means more strength. It means more blessing. It means a wider circle. And I say to you, friends, that we must find a way forward that continues to open up this circle to receive all of us, every single one of us who would like to be here. And let us not forget to center science and research in our decisions about when and how to move forward with opening up our building. Because the worth and dignity of every person means that it is not worth the risk to a single life, the life of a single one of our beloved community to open back up again before we know it is safe. We are all longing to return home, me included. And in our own ways, each of us are going to find that home is some place that we have never been. That place, that place half remembered and half envisioned that we only catch glimpses of from time to time. That is the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Erie. As it is now, after all we've been through, this community right here, this inclusive widening circle of love and connection. And so as we engage in this conversation about, about how best to move forward, let's not forget too that we are, we are part of a wider circle and that resources, people, and other circles like this one are grappling with these same questions. And these folks can, can aid us, can give us ideas, can help in asking the right questions and in finding the right answers as we move towards that new normal. So I hope, I hope that each and every one of you will be willing to join in this conversation about how best to return safely and inclusively to gathering together once again. Let us find a way for the UU Congregation of Erie to be open to all who seek a place where they can speak with passion without the words catching in their throats. Community means strength. The more community, the more who can be here with us, the more strength, the more blessing, the more healing, the more freedom. I know that together, with love and justice in our hearts, we will eventually, and when the time is right, we will, all of us, find our way home.
and to continue the work of community this morning. We have a time of sharing of your joys and your concerns. We do this by sharing in the chat. You can just uh, share a few phrases about what you're feeling, what's on your heart this morning. And we will bear witness to one another's states of mind. While we do this, we'll hear Jackson play one of my favorite songs and boy, is it a great one for this time of year. Here comes the sun. Today, people expressed hope and joy at the, the imminent return of spring. Messages of hope about receiving vaccinations and, and looking forward to a time of being together. Messages of gratitude for this wonderful community and its strength. And also messages of missing friends and loved ones who continue to be far away. For all these joys and concerns for all that we keep in our hearts in silence, 
We are grateful and we are blessed to witness as a community. Our closing words today are from Reverend Cynthia Landrum. We begin to leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection. We don't leave our concerns or our care for each other or our service to each other, to the world and to our faith. All of that continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, and be loving. And now comes the time when we extinguish our chalices and return to our ordinary time. If you'd like to say uh, the words to the chalice extinguishing, they are on the screen and I invite you to blow out your candle or your chalice along with me. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And Jackson is going to take five.
Wow, thank you. That was terrific. So uh, we usually invite uh, anyone who has any announcements to um, go ahead and share them at this time. I do. Oh, great. Uh, this is a, let me 